So, hello everyone. Uh, so what I'm going to be talking about is how to compute Nash equilibria in extremely large zero-sum extensive form games. Okay? And this is joint work with Kevin Waugh, Fatma Kilin Karshan, and Thomas Sandholm. Okay, so first for a little bit of motivation. So why do we care about this problem? Well, extensive form games are a very broad class of games, and they can model things like sequential or simultaneous interaction, outcome uncertainty, and imperfect information, okay? And they have a broad range of applications like negotiation, sequential auctions, uh, physical and cybersecurity games, and maybe most famously, recreational games such as poker, okay? And here's a brief overview of the talk. I'm gonna talk about the sequence form transformation, uh, which is a particular way of formulating uh, the strategy spaces of extensive form games. I'm gonna talk about bilinear saddle point problems, which is the class of optimization problems that computing zero-sum Nash equilibria falls in. I'm gonna talk about first order methods, which is uh, the class of algorithms that we're gonna be using for solving this problem. I'm gonna be talking about smoothing techniques for sequential games, and uh, basically what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be running a gradient descent-like algorithm on the strategies of the two players, and in order to do that, we wanna smooth out their optimization problems, okay? And then finally, I'll uh, present some nice experimental results that show that this actually works in practice. Okay, so very briefly, what is an extensive form game? It consists of a game tree, such as the one that I'm showing here. Uh, each node belongs to some player. Uh, that player can be player one or player two, or it can be chance. And chance always moves with, uh, moves with fixed probabilities. For any given node, the branches at the node denote actions for the player. Uh, so for example, up here, player one can go either left or right, right? Um, and then finally, we have information sets. And information sets are groups of nodes belonging to the same player, such that the player can't distinguish among which of the nodes they're at. So for example, down here, uh, player one has an information set consisting of these two nodes. We're denoting it by a dotted line. And player one doesn't know whether they're here or here, and so they have to have the same distribution over the actions at this information set, okay? Uh, finally, we have payoffs at leaves, and since this is a zero-sum game, uh, we can just have a single value. By convention, we're gonna say that's the utility to player two. So player two always wants to maximize the expected value over the leaf nodes, and player one wants to minimize it. Okay? Now, given the setup, a Nash equilibrium, since it's a zero-sum game, is really just a solution to this min-max problem here. So player one wants to minimize over their strategy vector x, Player two wants to maximize over their strategy vector Y, and the objective is the expected utility for player two, given the choice of strategies, okay? Um, now, the sequence form is how we're gonna formulate our optimization problem. So it's a technique for obtaining a linear program uh, representation, or um, yeah, representation of the Nash equilibrium problem. And it per exploits something called the perfect recall property, okay? And so we're gonna assume that we have perfect recall. Very briefly, perfect recall means that for any given information set, the player always knows which last action they themselves took in order to reach that information set. And so this game here, for example, obeys that because, for example, here, player one knows that if they're in this information set, even though they don't know which node they're at, they know that they last took uh, this action up here, okay? And so that's important, and without that, the sequence form does not work as, a, as, a, as, a, as an algorithm, okay? And given that we have perfect recall, the sequence form, what it does is that it says that instead of saying that we're gonna have a probability distribution over, say, for example, the actions here, instead, we're gonna have sort of pseudo probabilities that instead of summing to one, they're gonna sum to the value that we put on the action up here, okay? And so, in math, that looks like this. So now, a strategy uh, is represented by, or the set of feasible strategies is represented by these constraints, as well as a non-negativity constraint that I forgot. Um, so for information sets where there's no preceding uh, information set belonging to that player, we just say that the variables have to sum to one, right? So we want a probability distribution here. We want a probability distribution here, but, for example, down here, we no longer say that uh, Xe and Xf, which are the pseudo probabilities that we put on these actions, sum to one. 
Instead, they sum to XR, right, which is the last action taken by player one before reaching this information set. And so what that does is that it effectively sort of linearizes things because now XE, for example, actually represents the probability here times the probability here. And that's going to allow us to get a linear formulation. And this is a well-known technique uh, that's been used in many papers. Okay, we do the same for player two, not particularly interesting for the example game here. And now the important thing is when we want to actually compute the utility for a given player, right, we want to take the expectation over the leaf nodes. But now, for a given leaf node, for example here uh, is the expression for this leaf node here, we just take the utility, which is six, multiply it by chance, which is one over three, and then we just have to multiply by the value that we're putting on the last sequence by player two and the last sequence by player one, okay? So that's this sequence for player one and this one for player two. And what that means is that if we hold one player fixed, it becomes linear for the other player, okay? And if we want to recover standard probability distributions at a given information set, we can just divide by the parent sequence value. Okay? So just a little bit of notation. We're going to say that capital X is the set of sequence form strategies for player one. We're going to say that capital Y is the set of sequence form strategies for player two. And as we just saw, these are specified by linear equalities. So they're both convex polytopes. Okay? We're also going to assume that we have access to some utility matrix A. It's going to encode the utility function for player two. And the number of non-zero entries in this matrix is going to be equal to the number of leaf nodes in the game tree. Okay? Now that said, we actually don't need to even write down this sparse matrix. All we need to be able to do is to compute X transpose A or A times Y. Okay? So that's how we get gradients for the two players, given the current strategy of the other player. And if we have these, then the optimization problem is now as follows, okay? So player one wants to minimize over their set of sequence form strategies. Player two wants to maximize over their set. And the objective is X transpose A Y. And here's an example of how this, uh, what this utility matrix looks like. So we still have the same example game. And as you can see, the number of rows is just equal to the number of sequences for player one plus the empty sequence. And the same, uh, the number of columns is equal to the number of sequences for player two. I won't go into too much detail here, but just note that basically what we have at entries corresponds to, for example, this leaf node here. It goes in here because we have the last sequence is E for player one, the last sequence is C for player two, okay? And what we write in is just the utility times the probability that chance has of reaching it. Okay, so how do we solve these? So we have this objective. Well, one thing we can do is linear programming, okay? And that's a well-known technique. Um, but the problem is that the iterations of simplex algorithm or interior point methods are going to be way too expensive because we're going to have to invert these matrices that are way too large. So we can't do a single iteration. They also often won't fit in memory, although that's not as important because the expensive iterations become a limiting factor much earlier. Okay, so instead, in practice, what's preferred is to use these iterative epsilon Nash equilibrium algorithms, such as the counterfactual regret minimization algorithm or first order methods. We're going to focus on first order methods, but the CFR algorithm is sort of the practical state of the art currently. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about how we can smooth out these problems in order to run a first order method on them. Okay, so again, this is our problem. And now, if we think about it from the perspective of player one, right, we can think of it as player one is really just mixed, uh, minimizing this convex function f of x, right, where f of x encodes the best response by player two. Similarly, player two is really just maximizing a concave function that encodes the best response from player one. So, one is convex, the other is concave. This is convex optimization, so we could apply something like subgradient descent. But it turns out that this is not very great, and we can actually do better. The way we can do better is by smoothing out our optimization problem. And so if we take the functions again, what we do is we construct these new smooth variants of them. And so what we have here is we have f hat and phi hat, where we still have the best response, but in computing the best response for, say, the y player here, they are now penalized by some smoothing term, okay? And this function, the d of y here, is going to be a differentiable and strongly convex function 
And then we just have a weighting term mu of y that we can decrease over time. And so basically, the more weight we put on this smoothing function, the more we smooth out the optimization problem. OK? And so once we have this set up, uh, there exist sort of standard algorithms that can solve this problem, such as, for example, something called the excessive gap technique, which was developed by Nestrop. And it's basically a gradient descent-like algorithm on these smoothed functions. And what it does is it starts out by applying very aggressive smoothing. And then over time, you reduce this smoothing um, until you converge to an equilibrium. And it converges at a linear rate in the number of iterations. I won't focus too much on these constants here, but they're basically what we work out in this paper for the particular type of smoothing that we do. Okay. So what do we need on these distance functions? So we need them to be differentiable on the strategy space, and we need them to be strongly convex, modulus some constant c. Okay? Here I'm giving the definition, but I won't go through the math. I'll give a picture in a second. Uh, the other thing we care about is the polytope diameter, which is the maximum distance between any two points as measured by the distance function. Okay? Now, strong convexity just looks as follows. So if we have some nice function like this curve here, Strong convexity says that if we take the linear approximation to the function at some point x0, then basically we want the gap between the linear approximation and the actual function to grow uh, according to some norm as we move away from the point that we took the linear approximation at. Okay? And this norm here in our work is going to be the L1 norm, but it can be different norms and you can specialize, it, specialize this to the domain. Okay. So just an, as an example, if we were optimizing over an n-dimensional simplex, then it's a well-known result that the negative entry function is what you should be using to smooth this problem. If you do that, you get that the diameter becomes logarithmic in the dimension, so that's nice, and you get strong convexity modulus one. Okay. Now, just to hammer home sort of what smoothing is doing, let's say we have this function here where player one is choosing a value between zero and one, and player two gets to choose a linear combination over three linear functions, okay? That function ends up looking like this from the perspective of player one. Now, if we penalize uh, the choice of the linear combination for player two with some smoothing function and some weight, then we get functions that look like this, where this is a lot of smoothing, and then as we apply less and less smoothing, it looks more and more like the original function, okay? And this is basically what we're going to do over time. We're going to decrease the amount of smoothing. OK, so how do we actually smooth extensive form games? So the strategy spaces are a little bit more complex than simplexes, but they're very related, and that's kind of the key. So remember the sequence form, right? It was saying that for each information set, the sum of the sort of pseudo probabilities that we pick should sum to the value of the parent action that led to that information set. One way to think of that is that every information set is still a simplex, but that simplex gets scaled by the parent action that led to it. So for example, let's say we have some information set, number three here for player one. Then this information set is, normally we would say that the probability is sum to one, but now we're scaling them down by x1, where x1 is the variable representing whatever actions led to that information set, okay? And what you get is what we call a treeplex, which is kind of like a tree of simplexes, where each simplex, simplex is scaled by the parent. Okay? Now, what we do is we still use the entropy function. So on each individual simplex, we apply the entropy function because we know that that works well. But now we need to sort of link them up with each other. Um, the way we do that is by dilating the entropy function by the parent sequence. And this was uh, introduced by Hodadal, this class of functions. Um, it looks like this. I won't go through the detail. Uh, in order to get um, a smoothing function for the whole strategy space, we just take the sum over these individual uh, entropy functions over all the simplexes. Okay? And so if we do that, and we use a particular set of weights in this summation that are as follows, then we get our main theorem. So our main theorem is that this distance function is strongly convex, modulus one over m, on a triplex uh, x, and m is the maximum value of the L1 norm over, over x, and remember x is the sequence form strategy space, okay? And one thing that I won't go into much detail on, but this bound is actually independent of the action space size in a certain sense. So if we think of the triplex, we actually have no dependence on the number of actions 
at, at any given information set. Okay. Um, in, in contrast to previous results, which did have a dependence on that. Okay. We have a slightly more general theorem that this uh, previous theorem is just an instantiation of, which says that our an analysis actually works for any set of weights that satisfy a particular recurrence that generalizes the weights that I'm presenting here, and this analysis is also tight. Okay? Uh, if we plot that into the excessive gap technique and do some more math, then we get a state-of-the-art convergence rate uh, on computing a Nash equilibrium. And compared to related work, well, the practical state-of-the-art uh, algorithm has a convergence rate that has a square root dependence on the number of iterations, so that's much worse, whereas we have a linear dependence. Uh, previous work that instantiated these 1 over t algorithms did have a dependence on this branching factor that I mentioned that we have no dependence on, so we get rid of a b to the power of 2 times the depth of the game dependence on the branching factor associated with the number of actions at information sets, um, which is a really big difference. Okay. Now, then we tried this on some actual games to see whether it's actually fast. And we tried this on a game called the Duke Hold'em. The Duke Hold'em is a simplified poker game that sort of retains a lot of nice uh, game structure while being small enough that we can actually compute things like best responses to see whether we're actually converging fast. Okay? Um, and we can instantiate different uh, variants of this game by using different deck sizes. And we're going to look at two uh, in this talk, but we have some more in the paper. Six card Leduc has about 2,000 nodes in the game tree. Uh, 30 card Leduc has about 40,000 nodes in the game tree. And so our results look like this. So six card Leducs over here, 30 card Leducs here. Uh, we have three algorithms plotted. We have the CFR algorithm, which used to be the state of the art. Then we have CFR plus, which is a newer variant. Uh, and then we have the excessive gap technique instantiated with our smoothing technique, okay? And as you can see, we have a much better convergence rate and it's better across the number of iterations. So we have, well, we actually we have the number of tree traversals here, which is kind of a proxy for the number of iterations of each algorithm. And then we have the regret, uh, the maximum regret over the players on the y-axis. Now, it used to be kind of folklore that these 1 over t algorithms were asymptotically better but were worse early on. Uh, in these experiments, we see that actually we find that there, this algorithm with our smoothing technique is better uh, at any point in time across the number of iterations. And so that's pretty nice and encouraging. And another thing is that it used to be the case that as you made the game larger, so for example here to here, the shifting point of when the asymptotics kicked in would move out, okay? So that was not super appealing for solving extremely large games. Uh, but here, it doesn't really look like anything like that is happening. And we have some, number, uh, some more experiments on, on various other game sizes in the paper. Okay, uh, so in conclusion, we presented sort of optimal um, uh, instantiations of the dilated entropy function for smoothing extensive form games. We proved uh, tight state-of-the-art bounds on the convergence rate for these methods. And then we presented encouraging experiments that beat current practical state-of-the-art algorithms. And one sort of open question is, what if you apply this to an enormous game where we can't even compute best responses and stuff like that? So that's still left us future work. Thank you.